Namaste. So today we're going to continue <laughs> with Aparokshanubhuti and uh, discuss many similes that point us to the real nature of Brahman. So let's begin. Just as blueness in the sky, water in a mirage, and a human figure in a post are but illusory, so is the universe in Atman. These are references to the Upanishads. In the Upanishads, many similes are discussed. That is to point us towards a correct understanding of Brahman. Brahman is the principal subject matter of the Vedas and especially of the Upanishads. And they use a process of deliberate superimposition of yaya. Now, superimposition is also the mechanism of maya, the illusory uh, creation that seems to be real only because it's superimposed upon Brahman, which is actually real. So in this creation, we run across many situations of illusory identity, superimposition, avyaya. The first one, the blueness of the sky. Well, the word for sky is akash. Akash means actually space. Space is colorless. It has no attributes. It's completely frictionless. It's only a medium for the passage of other vibrations. But it itself never changes. So then, why is the sky blue? Because of the refraction of the air molecules. The sunlight has a particular frequency that is absorbed by the molecules and reabsorbed and re-emitted as blue light. So the sky appears to be blue, but actually the akash, the space, is colorless. Similarly, there are so many attributes, so many qualities, so many names and forms in this material creation, but they are not really present in Brahman, just like the blue color of the sky is not present in Akash, in space. Then he talks about the water in a mirage. We've already brought up this example many times, how the water in the, in the mirage appears in the desert due to temperature inversions. But actually, there is no water. Similarly, there seems to be consciousness and real existence in this material world. But actually, there isn't. <laughs> Those are only appearances. And because they're appearances only, as soon as we place any faith in them, or as soon as we become dependent on them or conditioned by them, we experience disappointment. And this is the suffering, the dukkha of the material world, the unsatisfactoriness of all material objects. And finally, he mentions the human figure in a post. This is similar to the snake in the rope. Someone goes out at night or in a storm when there's poor visibility, or maybe they're intoxicated or they lost their glasses, <laughs> and they see a human post, and they see what appears to be a human figure, an intruder, maybe a thief, and they run back and yell, help, help, thief. <laughs> but when someone comes out with good vision or sober over the light, they can see, oh, this is just a post, not a human figure. So how did the post 
become hallucinated as a human figure. It's simply because we have some vasanas, we have some latent desires. Maybe they're from previous lives, or maybe they're from earlier in this life, traumatic experiences and like that. And so we are afraid of intruders, we're afraid of thieves. So when we go out on a dark night, or when there's poor visibility and we see this thing standing there, just like the rope and the snake, we ascribe qualities to it it doesn't really possess. So in a similar way, when we encounter Brahman, Saguna Brahman, with qualities and forms, we remember things, desires, fears, and so on, and we superimpose them on Brahman. And this is superimposition of Yaya, the mechanism of illusion. Brahman is free from illusion. So we have to use these similes to understand Brahman and separate it from the illusion so that we can meditate on Brahman and worship Brahman. That's the practical application of these similes. Just as the appearance of a ghost in an empty place, of a castle in the air, and of a second moon in the sky are illusory, so is the appearance of the universe in Brahman. So, to continue similar similes. <laughs> Sometimes if one goes in an empty place, he becomes fearful that, oh, maybe there's a ghost here. And because of the expectation, he perceives something. Maybe there's a sound. It could be just a small animal, but he interprets it as the presence of a ghost. And because of that, he begins to actually hallucinate a ghost. And so on. Castles in the air. Sometimes when the sun is just rising or setting and there are clouds on the horizon, it appears that there's a city in the sky. This is called the city of the Gandharvas or the castle, the palace of the Gandharvas in Vedic literature. So this is a very common illusion that one seems to see a great city on the horizon, but actually it's just distant clouds backlit by the sun. And similarly, if one gets drunk <laughs> and his eyes begin to wander, he may see two moons in the sky instead of one. But this is simply due to intoxication. It's an illusion, it's, a, it's another mirage of Maya. So in the same way, the presence of the universe in Brahman is simply a mirage. Why do we say that it's a mirage, that it's non-existent? Because it's temporary. The next morning or the, or the next day, when there aren't no, no clouds on the horizon, you don't see that city anymore. Similarly, if you go in the daytime to that same empty place, you don't see any ghost. Or you, when you wake up in the morning, you may have a bad hangover, <laughs> but you only see one moon or one sun. So in the same way, when we actually apply these similes to our perception, we can understand very clearly, oh, actually, there is no reality to this universe. This universe is simply an appearance. It's a hallucination. Even Einstein said, the appearance of the material world to our senses is an outstanding, remarkable mass hallucination. <laughs> of course, he was speaking from the perspective of a physicist who thinks everything is made up of atoms and force fields and energy. 
But we are speaking from the perspective of consciousness, which can understand that consciousness is different from its objects. Consciousness is the reality. The objects are simply perceptions. They come and go, so they aren't real. Just like when we go to sleep at night and the whole material world simply disappears. So we can understand it must have been a dream. Maybe it's a longer lasting dream than our dreams at night, but it's still temporary. Therefore, it's unreal. Just as it is water that appears as ripples and waves, or again, it is copper that appears in the form of a vessel. So it is Atman that appears as the whole universe. So this is clear. If you go down to the ocean, there are many waves, but all of them are simply ocean water. Same with the ripples in a pond. When the wind comes up or we throw a stone in the pond, we haven't added anything, we haven't changed anything, but suddenly ripples appear where there weren't any before. And in the same way, copper or maybe clay is the ingredients that create a vessel or a pot. But that doesn't mean that the pot is real. Relative to the ingredient, the pot is very temporary. So similarly, Atman is the ingredient that appears as the entire universe. So this is the answer to the riddle or to the question that I asked yesterday. Uh, what is the similarity between the three similes that were given in the verse? And the answer is that in all cases, it separates the ingredient from the form that it takes. And if we apply this in our meditation, in our contemplation, we can see that actually consciousness, Brahman, is the prime ingredient of everything. Without consciousness, there is nothing less than nothing, because there's nobody to perceive it. <laughs> Even, you know, in the uh, jhanas of the Buddha's meditation, in the uh, seventh jhana, there's nothingness, shunyata, emptiness. But the question then arises, who is perceiving the emptiness? <laughs> Whenever I tried to meditate on emptiness, suddenly Brahman would appear as a great light. So in the same way, this material universe is actually just empty. It's empty of things, but it's full of Atman. It's full of Brahman. And this is the real meaning of existence. So I encourage you to use these similes as meditations to try to extract, well, here's another simile. Try to extract the essence of consciousness from perception, just like extracting ghee from milk. If you know how ghee is made, the milk is curdled and then the curds are churned and they yield butter. Then the butter is cooked until all the solids um, precipitate out. And that's ghee, what's left is ghee. So similarly, by process of elimination, if we remove all the illusory elements from our perception, what is left is only Brahman. And this is the essence of enlightenment. Aum Tatsa. 
ఆం శాక్తి ఆం